it's down here. So I have no shirt and tie tonight, just relaxing. And I was studying this morning. The Lord gave me some good study time with him for a couple of hours. I really uh, enjoyed sitting on my back porch, just kind of praying and studying. Uh, you know, I thought uh, as I was reading through Isaiah, I came across a verse. What is the purpose of man? What is really our purpose here? Yeah, the kids can go ahead and be dismissed. Did you turn it on? Okay. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the message tonight. Again, the kids can be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless this message tonight. I thank you, Lord, for giving it to me. I pray you bless your people. I thank you for the good spirit that's here tonight, for the good singing, Lord, for the good testimonies, tremendous testimonies. Lord, the 20 souls that have been saved over the past couple of weeks, uh, what, a, what a blessing, Lord, to know uh, souls are still getting saved. and. Thank you for that. I pray that we continue to witness and may this even charge us up, Lord. I pray that you bless the church baptism that's coming Sunday. I pray that uh, that we could have a good day, Lord, of fellowship and, and uh, Lord, it just be a, a good spiritual moment, Lord, for everybody. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so what is the chief purpose of man? The chief purpose. Why are we here? Uh, man was created by God, and the image of God created he, him. And a lot of people, I know, uh, being an educated person, I've been around educated people, and sometimes educated people can get so caught up in education and knowledge. With much knowledge comes sorrow. Uh, there could be a lot of depression with people who learn and get, uh, as the Bible says in the book of Daniel, in the end times, knowledge shall increase. People are going to learn, 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 learn. And sometimes they get so smart that they begin to question why they're even here. And I've had many, again, educated people uh, question, why do we have existence? What is the real purpose? And when people say, well, it's to live your life, and to have a family, to live, enjoy life. But then people will say, but what's the purpose and what's the reason? <clears throat> and it sometimes can go down into a dark, dark, dark hole when you don't realize what is the purpose for our existence. Now, if you know your Bible, <clears throat> your Bible can keep you from those depressive moments. And when you have them, possibly, the Lord can show you that the reason we're here is not for our own purpose. And what this does, it gives us a purpose to live. And it's a perfect segue into the testimonies tonight about leading people to Christ. If you have a purpose-driven life and you live for the Lord and you know my purpose here is to be a good testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ, my purpose here is to win souls so that I can prepare people for the other side. My purpose as a preacher is to develop Christians, to train you, teach you, and get you to a point where you can go out into this world and you can win people to Jesus. Now, in the end, the purpose for our existence is to honor and glorify God. That's what the purpose of our existence is. Now, the Bible tells us that in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43, as I was reading through my Bible, I came across this verse. Isaiah chapter 43. In Isaiah chapter 43, and it says in verse number seven, Let's go ahead and start in verse number one. It says, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee. So who created us? The Lord. And this is where, again, men get themselves into a real, real fit and get down into that dark hole when they start denying the existence of God. That's a real problem. And it becomes, in the end, it bears forth fruit that leads to that darkness when you get away from the Lord because you're getting away from the light. And when you get away from the Lord, 
you get into darkness. And when you get away from, from admitting that God did the creating, admitting that we are, we are direct, in some ways, offspring of God, physically, you know, when you think about Adam was made in the image and likeness of God, okay, he made him that way. Now, we know after the fall that we're made in the image and likeness of Adam, but nonetheless, we still bear that image of God through Adam, and our new man is created after righteousness and in holiness. Our new man is definitely a direct offspring from God, just like I told the young man I led to Christ today. I said to him, Christ came into your heart today. He now walks with you. The Lord talks with you. The Lord interacts with you. The Lord will direct you. The Lord loves you. The Lord has become your father, true father, okay? Our heavenly father. We are God's offspring once we get saved, okay? We're born of God. So, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Now, we know God had a special relationship with Israel. It says in verse 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Now, I often think of this. Isaiah was written before Daniel, correct? It was written before the captivity. So those young Hebrew boys, did they have access to that verse? They would have read it. They would have read it. And when Nebuchadnezzar says, oh, you won't bow down to the image. And they said, and he basically said, hey, I'll give you a second chance. When you hear the music and you see all that's going on, if you bow down, then you'll be accepted. But if not, you're going to be thrown into the midst of a fiery furnace. And they said, King, we're not careful to answer thee. We're not bowing. Do you think in the back of their mind they had this verse ringing out? What does it say? When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Now I'll tell you this much. If I had the opportunity to know that verse of scripture, and if they say, if, if I was in those boys' shoes, that verse would come ringing out in my mind, and I would think, oh boy, God, do I really believe your word? Could we make it through that fire, as you said? And is that verse specifically for us? Don't you think that sometimes in the Bible you've read verses? that maybe the Lord gave you specifically on that day for your cause? Who's ever felt that way? That you got a verse and you said, that verse is for me. Now, doesn't the daily verse come out all the time and we see it and sometimes we go, oh, that's a good verse. But boy, sometimes we see that daily verse and we go, man, do I need that verse? Wow. And others might say, why do you need it? So you don't understand. This verse hits everything that's been going on in my life. This is directly from God. The verse was always there. But on that particular day, going through that particular trial, the Lord said, here's what you need. And you said, wow, did that answer me? I'm going to go ahead and move on with the thing that I've been praying about. I'm going to take whatever opportunity I have here, or I'm going to go ahead and enter into this relationship with this person because the Lord gave me the stamp of approval, or I'm going to buy this house or buy this car because the Lord gave me the stamp of approval to do it, or I'm going to go ahead and take that job. I've been praying about that thing, and it, God gave me this verse. Do you think at that particular moment, the Lord whispered in their ear and said, I'll be with you. When thou goest through the fire, shall not be burned. King, we won't bow. And didn't he throw him in there? When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, 
and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not. For I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Look at this. Why are we here? Here's the chief purpose of man right here. Even everyone that is called by my name, are we? Are we? What are we called? We're called Christian. And the root word of that word Christian is Christ. And a Christian should be Christ like. Christ like. Okay. Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him. Why? For my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have made him. Why were we created? Why? What's the purpose? So we could just live our life and we could just focus on ourselves our whole life and be selfish and just go through life. Is that why? You know, when you, here's the thing. God is so unselfish that when you focus on God, God always blesses you in return. Think about it. If God, he's so unselfish, even in a tithe, how much does he take? How much does he want? He says, hey, I'll take 10%. Just give me 10% and I'll give you 90. Would the devil do that? Hey, give me your life. Give me your heart. And I'll direct every one of your steps. Would the devil do that? God is an unselfish Master, you think for his purposes, that's why we're here. Every amount of effort you give to God, God will bless that. Every bit of it. Every time you give of yourself to God, God will never forget what you did. He's amazing. Let's go over to Psalm 30, Psalm chapter 30, Psalm chapter 30. Psalm chapter 30. God gets great delight when we praise his name. He gets great delight when we talk about his glory. God loves it when we brag about him. And I don't know if Christians do enough bragging about God. We should brag about him more. Doesn't he give us every breath we take? And doesn't he control everything? You get up in the morning and you roll out of bed and God's there to welcome you. You wake up maybe and you have a bad dream and you feel alone, but you understand God's there. God's there. He'll be with you. Uh, Psalm chapter 30, verse number one, I will extol thee, O Lord, for thou hast lifted me up and hast not made my foes to rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried unto thee and thou hast healed me. O Lord, thou hast brought up my soul from the grave. Thou hast kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. The Lord likes it when you sing. He likes it when you sing unto him. It says in verse 5, For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And how many have claimed that verse? And in my prosperity I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face 
and I was troubled. Every time in your life you feel that the Lord's a little distant, you get a little bit troubled, and you think, I need to get right with the Lord. You know, God will do that occasionally. Uh, verse 8, I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made my supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I shall go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Look in verse 12. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O my Lord, O Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. Why are we here? Why are we here? To sing praises unto the Lord. To give glory and give thanks unto thee forever. Now, not just us, but why did God make everything? Why did God make that sparrow? Why did God make those ants? Why did God make those cherubims that stand before his throne? Why did God make it all? You know, my grandson is little Justin. He loves animals. And he loves little programs that talk about animals and talk about dinosaurs. And oftentimes it will be like, Pappy, you got to see this. Pappy, you got to see this. And I'll listen in. But what irks me the most, and it's good stuff, he's learning, but the subtleness of the ones who are teaching about these animals and these dinosaurs. And they always have to slip in certain things to try to get these kids to not believe that God made it all. And as we are watching, and, and again, I pray and I pray for all of our children, but I can see in him a real desire to learn. He's even a little bummed out that summer vacation came because he misses being in school. How about it, Britt? He didn't take after you, right? <laughs> because every day, Britt would be like, oh, I don't want to go to school. Summertime comes, summer vacation. Let's go to the beach. Let's have a good time. Britt, you got to go back to school. I want to go back to school. But her offspring wants to go to school and is bummed out when summer vacation comes because he loves to learn. And I pray, and I pray about many of, we got a, a, a church full of a lot of smart kids, really, that really like to learn. But yet in that, the danger, the danger, you get around someone that doesn't believe in the Lord, someone that doesn't want to give God the glory, and the next thing you know, they're making these kids and turning them into evolutionists. And people that believe, oh, it just came, it just came through the Big Bang Theory. The other one, the big one out now is, oh, we, we now think that life came from outer space. Who's heard this one? You know, they change their mind like you change your clothes. You know, now it's, now it's from outer space. You know, these organisms invaded from outer space and therefore they got the thing going, you know. You know. They're so sure of this. And give or take a couple million a year as this happened, you know. And it's like, oh, that's real accurate. When it would be so much easier just to say, God did it. God did it. Can man fully know the mind of God? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways than your ways, saith the Lord. You know, they will not give credit to God for his smarts, for his design, for his omniscience. That's all God wants. He just wants us to say, 
when we see his creation, wow. Wow. You are awesome. Do you ever just go somewhere and look at it? You can't take your eyes off of it. It's just that beautiful. To some, they'd say, that's the way it evolved. How would God have you look at that? What would he want you to say? What would he want you to think? Why are we here? Why did he do that? Don't you say, wow, God, what you made. It's unbelievable. That's what God wants. And I tell you, when people do that, God blesses them. God blesses them. Doesn't the Bible say, let all that have breath. Do what? Let all that have breath. Praise the Lord. Everybody in this room has breath. And everybody in this room ought to praise God. Say, but what do we have to praise God for? What don't we have to praise God for? How about your very eyes? How about your hands? How about when you taste something so good? You go, you know, people, you taste it, whoa. Is so good. God let you taste that because he put little taste buds there. And he said, I'll make man and I'll let him enjoy those things. But yet there are people who before they put it in their mouth won't thank God for it. What are we here for? Why did God make all this? Why did God make kangaroos? I was watching a thing about Australia. And there was a kangaroo hopping. And I said, what a strange looking creature. We don't have them in North America. If I went there, I'd be like, what in the world? If that was the first thing I, if I was an explorer and I got there, I'd be like, what is that thing? The weirdest looking creature with a little pouch here and, you know, Couple little kangaroos down there, say, with the huge feet. You say, God made that. Why did God make all that? You ever read Revelation 4? Let's go to Revelation 4. Revelation chapter 4. Name another animal that's just so curious when you see it. Why did God make that? Pandas. They don't do anything. You love them. They're black and white bears. What else? Huh? A duck-billed platypus. Okay, a duck-billed platypus. Say, and some say, what is it? You know, why did God make it? I think the fish with the saw. You know, why did you make that? An axolotl, that's the big one with the kids nowadays. I don't even know what, I didn't know, I had to go look it up. I said, I want to get an axolotl. I'll be like, what? I thought it was, you know, some kind of car or something like that. An axolotl, here it's an animal. <clears throat> what you say, what do you live in a cave? Who knew what an axolotl was? Who didn't? Who's never heard of one? Okay, there we go. An axolotl, they've been around. What else? Say, why did God make that? A porcupine. A puffer fish. You say, those are really strange. The archer fish. You know, the one that has the little light at the end. They live way down there, you know. And they got the big sharp teeth and they light it. And the other fish. 
<laughs> they get mesmerized and they don't realize the face that's behind that would scare pain off the wall. And they get too close and it's over with. Why did God make that? And then you watch the, the shows. It evolved after millions of years. It once was a horse and now it's this and now it's that. And then it grew a neck because it stretched and went like this and it turned into poof and now it's a giraffe. And it started out as an archer fish. Because they don't know, did it come from the sea? Well, we think it all came from the sea first, but we're not sure. But now we think it came from outer space, so we don't know where it landed. They were sure before, but now they have tons of questions. If you believe your Bible, you just say, God did it. Right? How simple. God made it, and he made everything after their kind. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. John goes up to heaven. And it's weird because John is the perfect type of the raptured saint. And I think when John goes up, this is what he sees. And he gets a lot of questions answered like right away. And I believe we're going to, the same thing's going to happen to us. We're going to go out and the Lord's going to answer a lot of questions real quick. And we're going to get a good understanding of heaven real fast. Revelation chapter four. After this, I looked. Behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Okay, so type of the raptured saint. And this is not John the Baptist. This is John the Apostle. When I was teaching, I didn't clarify. I didn't think I needed to. But this is John the Apostle. This is not John the Baptist. John the Apostle wrote Revelation. He's called John the Beloved as well. Okay, he was one of the disciples, whereas John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus, not one of the original disciples. Verse two, and immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. So when people like Pietro, he was talking earlier about he was talking to some kids and they were asking him questions about being born of heaven and about heaven itself. And he was talking about the streets of gold and this and, and the question comes, well, what are we going to see when we get there? Well, if you read Revelation 4, you get the good idea of what you're going to see immediately. Okay, so, and again, the word immediate is used in verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit. So when the rapture happens or when death happens, we're in the spirit. So our spiritual eyes get opened. And behold, a throne was set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. Now, jaspers can be different colors in the scripture. And I believe the one here, jasper, is probably a clear stone, probably a clear stone and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald, so green rainbow. And round about the throne were four and 20 seats. And upon the seats, I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So if you can picture this, what you have is a circle. You have a circle of 24 seats. So if we took 24 of our seats and we set them up and we put one seat here, another one here, another one here, another one here, all the way around, there would be 24 seats that would go around. They're kind of probably like thrones. Okay. Like King Arthur, you know, you think about the knights at the round table. There were how many of them? I think there were eight, weren't there? Anybody know for sure? Were there eight in the round table or were there 12? Okay, is there 12? Okay, I could, be, I could be wrong. Eight or 12. So my knowledge of King Arthur and his court, I don't know for sure, but let's say there's 12. 12 that make a circle and they all sit at a table. Now double that and make that table twice as big and put 24 seats. Okay, so you have a big circle around the throne. And he sees them with crowns on their head. So who are these 24 elders? My guess they would be 12 from the Old Testament, from, from the 12 tribes, and probably, who else? The 12 apostles, okay? My guess. So the only thing that throws that off a little bit would be John would have seen himself. Right? 
he was the beloved. And if those 12 apostles are the 12, unless one of the seats was empty, I don't know. Interesting stuff. So two of the seats might be empty because one of them could be for Paul. Judas would have vacated one, so Paul could have had the other. My guess, Paul and John would be there with the other with the other apostles. And then the 12 elders from the tribes in the Old Testament, 24. That's my guess. 12 from, okay? So you got 24. Now, again, what are they doing? And I saw four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. What an incredible, incredible sight this must have been. <laughs> Unbelievable sight. You got lightning coming out of the throne. Now, doesn't the Bible say I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven? Okay. And you got in the Old Testament in Ezekiel. And you got spirits in the Bible that come and move real quickly like lightning. Okay. So these the lightning coming out of the throne could be the movement of spirits because it's associated with the seven spirits of God. So you got spirits that could be moving real quickly and given this lightning appearance there. I, all I know is it's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. Before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Now, the other thing too, and I never really mentioned this here, but Dr. Ruckman does a drawing, and he he get, he nails this, I believe, in his drawing. The Emerald Rainbow and the elders and everybody think about if you have a frozen lake. Where am I going? You have a frozen lake. You got an Emerald Rainbow. And you got everybody in the throne of God sitting there. What's going to happen? That frozen lake is going to act like what? A mirror. So now you're going to have depth because of the ice. And you're going to have reflection and other things. So this, this emerald rainbow, rainbow is going to go like this. Because of the ice it's going to cause reflection and you're going to have a circle. Okay. So when John's looking at this thing, he's probably looking at this rainbow going this way. And this rainbow is not just this, but all the way down because he can see the reflection of this thing. So it looks like God is sitting in the midst of a circle of green. And then you got, it just, he does, Dr. Ruckman does a picture on this. If you haven't seen it, you should. It's beautiful. And he draws that that way. And again, he's an artist. He was an artist. He knows about all this reflection and refraction and all this stuff. But this green could go all the way around like a wheel. Just like in Ezekiel. Those creatures had the appearance of a wheel. Okay? A wheel within a wheel. And it's weird because the throne of God can be mobile. And we find in the book of Revelation, the throne of God moves, and these cherubims cause it to move. But anyway, you got this. Okay, so the picture that he sees is brilliant. It's amazing. He sees a sea of glass. And then he sees these four beasts, verse 7. And the first beast was like a lion. And the second beast was like a calf. And the third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Now, without getting into this too deeply, those beasts represent things. The lion represents the wild beasts. The calf represents domesticated beasts. Man represents man. And the eagle represents winged, winged fowl. What's the only thing that's missing? Reptile and fish. Okay, he said sea animals, reptiles and fish. Where's the representative? Well, you got man, don't you? And you got the eagle represents birds and you got the lion represents the wild beasts and you got the calf that represents domesticated beasts. Four. Where's the other representative? 
he was the one that covered. And that's why you see in Job chapter 41, Leviathan has scales and he swims in the deep. He represented the reptiles. He represented the fish. He fell. No longer is he covering. He fell. Four were there. There started five. One fell. John doesn't see the fifth one. Verse eight, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. What do they do? What do they do? What do these creatures do? What do the 24 elders do? All they do is give glory to God. They praise and they exalt and they worship the God of heaven. Now watch. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and 20 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the Lord saying, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Why are we here? We are here to give glory to God. We were created, and all things on this earth were created for God's pleasure. And when you keep that in perspective, you understand the reason God gave you life. It's not for your purpose. It's for the purpose of serving and worshiping the creator because he's the creator we are the creature and when the creature begins to worship the creature the creature gets in a real mess and you can find that in romans chapter one which i've gone to many many times that when the creature does not worship the creator the creator says you don't want to worship me you don't want to give me the glory and i'm going to turn you over to a reprobate mind and you're going to do things that you never dreamed you could do. You're going to do such wicked things that you're going to actually as to become reprobate. And the end result is men go with men and women go with women and the creation spirals downward until they become so reprobate because they didn't serve the creator. Our purpose is to serve and worship and glorify God. And again, you can go to Romans chapter 1. Now with all that, I'm not going to go to Romans 1 because I want to keep all that reprobate thought out right now because I'm tired of reprobates. Because that's all you hear in the media. That's all you see everywhere is everything is about their rights. Listen, they can have things the way they want it. But as far as we're concerned, let's keep God first. Let's keep God first. And let's enjoy worshiping and glorifying our Savior. And understanding the reason and purpose we're here. We have to walk around confused. Why are you here? I'm here to serve and worship and give glory to the God of heaven. Because every breath I take, he gives it to me. And every heartbeat that my heart beats, the Lord says, you can beat another and you can beat another. And thank you, God. And thank you, God. How does the last psalm what is it about? How does it end? How does the first psalm begin? What's the first word of the first psalm? Come on, anybody know? It's the largest book in the Bible. What's the first word of Psalms? 
Blessed. What's the second word? Blessed is the man that walketh. Walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Tonight, let's not stand with sinners. Let's not sit in the seat of the scornful. Let our delight be in God. Blessed is the man whose delight is in God. And how does the last psalm end? Let's go there then. Psalm is a great pattern of the whole Bible. Who wrote Psalms? Most of them. David. Type of Jesus. Man after God's own heart. If Psalm 1 1 starts off with blessed is the man, Psalm 150 should end with something special, shouldn't it? Psalm 150, verse 1. We'll be dismissed after I read this one. I hope you're enjoying this message tonight. Again, I want to stay away from Romans 1 because it gets depressing. Because of the present state of this world is Romans 1. Exactly. Romans 1, verse 18 and 25 explains exactly what's happening today. And if you can, go look at it. Psalm 150, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Come on. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. I wonder if we should praise God. <laughs> I wonder what God's trying to say here. Huh? Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Samuel. Get that trumpet back out. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. If Pietro were here, I'd say into Austin. We could have three trumpeteers going on. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with a timbrel and dance. Praise him with the string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high-sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. And there's one verse in Revelation that John says, every creature, every creature, every creature heard I say. Okay? All of God's creation. John writes this down and he says, every creature heard I say. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him every creature john heard say praise be to god it looks as if one day every creature that existed or has existed is going to open up their mouth and god's going to let them speak and they're going to praise god he writes it right in the book of revelation john says i heard every creature say it every creature why, do, why are we created? For his pleasure and for his glory and for his honor. And you, if you remember that, you understand life. Okay, we'll be dismissed.